Hello and welcome. I'm Pastor Bobby, lead pastor of Community Fellowship Church here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, it's our hope that this talk is going to be an encouragement for you on your spiritual journey. We do believe that you can have a spiritual connection with God, a personal connection, and that Jesus is your link to that. It's actually our goal for um, people at CFC to become committed followers of Christ. And we think these online talks are a great resource for you, but not a replacement for being part of a local community, a church. And so we want to encourage you to be plugged into a church somewhere where you are. But if you're ever in Lancaster, we'd love for you to come and visit us in person at some point. And you're welcome to check out more on our church at our website, communityfellowship.com. Um, hopefully this talk can be inspiring for you. We hope that you can enjoy it today. Good morning. It's good to be with you. I'm not Pastor Bobby. As many of you guys know, he is on sabbatical. He said last night, I'm interested to see after four weeks away if he can still lift this thing. Because this thing is heavy. He gets like that workout every week. You get used to it. Um, but it's heavier than you think for people like me, so I'll knock it over. Um, but uh, it is good to be with you guys today and uh, to open God's word. Uh, I realize that in the summer, it's hard to get here. Finishing up school, lots going on. Lots of things in your life, kids stuff, uh, being a parent, being a grandparent, travel, all those things. So just take a moment this morning and just relax for a second. It's, uh, it's a chaotic time. There's a lot going on. And just to be here, um, we, we want you to kind of sense God's presence here. You see that by our worship. You can see that by um, the prayers that are prayed over you guys. But we're excited to open God's word over the next four weeks while Bobby's gone and look at the book of Proverbs. And as you can see there, you know, God's wisdom for navigating life. Like, I think all of us in some way, shape, or form can, can say, yeah, I need that. I need that. I, you know, parent, uh, grandparent, uh, parent now with your kids out of the house, uh, work, you know, going on, different things there. Just the navigation of life, we could all use God's wisdom. So we're going to open the book of Proverbs. Some of you may know this, um, but Proverbs has 31 books. And 31 books of Proverbs kind of lines up perfect with the days of the month. So, hey, I would just encourage you, if you've never opened the Word of God, if you've been in a dry spell, if uh, you haven't been reading it, open it up, look at your watch. Okay, today is June 4th, read chapter 4. Read chapter 4. Tomorrow on June 5th, read chapter 5. Jeff Camo was here last night. He's the leader of our Step Forward. I had to encourage him, like, Jeff, do you need me to keep going and explain the rest of the way through, or are we good? He said he needed it. His wife said they were good, so we stopped right there. Okay, but hey, open it up. Read God's word every single day. I, I tell people all the time, like, um, you can open up a great leadership book or you can open up God's word, 100% truth, never going to let you down. I would encourage you every morning, open up God's word. Proverbs is a great place to start. Read it. Read a proverb every single day of the month, and you'll be in, good, in a good place, um, I believe, to gain that wisdom that only comes from the Lord. Proverbs 3, uh, verses 13 and 14 says this. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than the gain from silver, and her profit is better than gold. Let me just summarize it for you. Wisdom and understanding are far more valuable than any amount of money, thing, or goods that you can gain. I think that's why in the Old Testament, King Solomon could have asked for anything in the world, and what did he ask for? Saturday night responded to me. <laughs> 9 a.m. needs a little bit more Christians in the room. You need to read Proverbs this week, okay, 9 a.m.? What, what did he ask for? We asked for wisdom. He could ask for anything in the world, and he said, I want wisdom. But our culture, the culture we live in, puts a huge priority on money and goods and things you can gain, but, but the Bible continually reminds us that the wisdom of God is far better than anything and of far more value. So today we're going to open it up to the first of the four-week series in Proverbs while Bobby's gone. I would just encourage you guys as a body, uh, as the elder board, we are asking you guys to pray for Bobby. He's gone for four weeks away from the day-to-day -day ministry that he's been doing for Many, many years here at CFC, the blessing he's been to us. So we're asking you to join us in praying for him, that he would get rest, number one, and that he would be refreshed in God's word, number two. 
Okay, so would you join us in that as we go? Because over the next four weeks, you're going to be hearing from some different folks. And Bobby's away, and we believe that God has something great for the next season, and we're praying for Bobby as he gets away. Jason will be getting away later this summer. We're going to ask you to do the same thing, to be praying for Jason as well. So today we're going to look at a couple of Proverbs, but we're going to talk about this idea of wisdom in an age of outrage. See, it doesn't take long to look at our current events over the last few years to realize that we're living in an age of outrage. Some of you this morning feel outraged. Some of you got on Fox News or CNN or whatever and read the headlines and it welled up in you this outrage. COVID in 2020, mask or not to mask, welled up in outrage. It didn't matter which side of the aisle you are, you were on, you were outraged. The 2020 election, right? Oh my goodness, like we're, we'll stop right there, but I'm just gonna tell you something. <laughs> Bobby and I met and talked about this message and, and we were chatting and um, an election year is next year. And, and, and I'm, Jason said I went for the jugular last night, so maybe I'm gonna go for it again, I don't know. But here's the deal. And I'm just gonna say it, if it's Trump versus Biden again, it's not gonna be better. It's not going to be better. The rhetoric's already starting. There's already this in, inflammatory speech happening all around. It's being written. It's being reported on. It's coming out. It's going to be worse. And I am not an end times person. I am not a conspiracy theorist. I'm not coming to you with any of that. Just a critical thinker. It's not going to be better. And I'm burdened when I say that. You want to know why, church? And it may feel I'm going a little hard on Christians today. Well, I'm speaking to a mostly Christian audience. Some of you are in the room and you're exploring your faith. Some of you have been a Christian your whole life. But I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you, I'm, I'm burdened by that because I expect the world to do that. But I deeply desire a unified church. I don't desire us to all be on the same page and agree on everything. That's not what unity is. That's uniformity. That's not what I'm asking for. What I'm asking us to do is really think critically about how do we seek the Lord for wisdom in a time where everybody tells us to be outraged, everybody's trying to steal your rights, and we as Christians can fire up the outrage machine really fast. See, this is the age we live in. Let's look at it. a couple of characteristics of the age we live in. I don't need to explain these. You experience them every day polarization either you're a republican or a democrat a liberal or conservative a yankees fan or an orioles fan and if you're a yankees fan we have a prayer team outside for you <laughs> i see you back there kari i see you <laughs> tribalism like it comes out really nice in sports then it gets bad in different ways arguments happen division anger Hostility towards one another. This is the age we live in. This is it. You guys know it. You experience it. And then on top of that, because I think this has been there for a long period of time, and you read the word of God, like those people weren't exactly that great of people in the Old Testament. A lot of this was happening. There's disagreements and fights and arguments. I'm sure they had issues in Ephesus and in Philippi. They had all of that. But we have this thing that's like gasoline on the fire, and it's, amplified by social media by this interconnectedness we have at all moments of every single day with this thing called a cell phone think about this I think it's June 27th 2008 nobody had an iPhone 15 years later all of you have iPhones except the non-Christians in the room who still make our text messages green <laughs> Mike Conaghy right that, that, but, but 15 years ago, we didn't even know what an iPhone was. Apple announced it, I think, on June 27, 2008. That's crazy. This idea of connectedness, new technology. Ed Stetzer wrote a book that I read in preparation for this. It's called Christians in the Age of Outrage. Really good book. Would, would commend it to you if you want to read it. I'm going to summarize a couple things in his book today. We're going to use some of it today. But um, he said this. world with the discernment and wisdom seeing the world as the mission field to which God has called us 
Notice what he did not say, and I want to park here for a moment. He did not say, I want Christians to engage the outraged world with outrage. But how many of you remember, anybody have a Starbucks cup in the room today? You can repent later. Just kidding. I like Starbucks. I drink their coffee all the time. A lot of Bible studies happen in Starbucks. But in 2015, how many of you remember the red cup controversy? Remember Christmas came around? Some guy named Joshua Farnstein jumped on YouTube and said, Starbucks has removed Christmas from their cup. Now they just have this plain red cup. And what happened on social media? Maybe some of you guys will be going back and checking your Twitter accounts to see if you jumped in on that after this. Christians went nuts. The outrage machine kicked in. Social media started flying. Boycott Starbucks. Don't drink their coffee. Blah, 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 blah. But then all of a sudden, as we started doing some research, we realized that Starbucks had never told their employees they couldn't say Merry Christmas, which is what he claimed. They had never put their, um, said you can't say Merry Christmas in our store, and they had never actually put Christmas on the cup. Guys, Starbucks is not a Christian company. At least they don't say they are. I don't know, maybe there's great people in it. I'm sure there is. But they don't say they are, and what I'm going to tell you guys is that you as Christians sitting in the room have this money that we carry around in the United States, and it's, the color is green. And your money that's green is the same as somebody who doesn't claim Christ's money is green. And when you're a for-profit business, they really don't, they're just worried about that. They're not worried about that, all these other things. And so I just would encourage us as believers, like, take a step back and let's have wisdom in the moment. Because I promise nobody in the Starbucks boardroom on the day that that, all, that outrage kicked in, which, by the way, again, they never put Christmas on the cup. They had some snowflakes and some treats. Neither of which are exactly like pillars or symbols of Christianity. Okay? There was no fish on the cup or cross. There was no grave. No. Snowflakes, treats. But I guarantee nobody in the Starbucks boardroom that day was thinking, man, I'm so thankful for all the level-headed Christians out there that gave us grace in this moment. No. They were probably thinking they're just like the rest of this world. Outraged lunatic but but just in case that's not enough this happened again in 2018 at costco anybody have a costco membership card in the room raise it up we'll be trading them in for bj's cards afterwards okay it's like a one for one swap we got you costco guy snaps a picture of the bible in the fiction section and he says oh costco must think that the bible is not real and what happened social media Everybody, boycott Costco. Their pizza's too expensive now. All these things happen, right? We start firing up the Christian outrage machine, and guess what we do? We look just like the rest of the world. And so then there was this study done of all the other Costcos in the country, and you know where the Bible was? It was in the nonfiction section. One guy happened to make a mistake, put the Bible in the wrong place, and a picture on social media lit up the world. Guys, I would just encourage you that I'm not really sure as we look today, that's how Jesus handled these moments. I'm not sure he would have handled the 2020 election like we did. And I say we, and guys, listen, I'm not the one to give you this message. There's some people sitting on this side of the auditorium, I'm not gonna look at them that know me really well. See some people in the back. My personality is zero to 100. In no time at all. Ferrari ain't got nothing on me. Okay? I can get fired up pretty fast. Last night, Ellen Weimer was in the, in the room, and Kyle and I are really close. And, man, you should see it. When something hits Fox News, something hits ESPN, something, breaking news, you know what we do? We grab our phone. We screenshot or, you know, the fancy way where you can, like, send the link. We send it to one, and all of a sudden, text messages start flying. Any of you guys do that? Like immediately we start flying. We start responding to that moment, responding in emotion. And we all do it. That interconnectedness of the cell phone, of social media, creates in us this ability to air our opinions and our outrage and to respond emotionally in the moment. And trust me, I'm the chief of sinners. Yesterday, I had to coach two baseball games. I was losing my mind in the fifth inning because my older kids could not run the bases. And let me tell you, it was outrage. I think it was holy. 
They did not. But that may sound trivial, but that's how our world is. That yes, Chris, a bunch of eight, nine, and 10 year olds running bases is not that important. And you're right, it's not. But do you see how easy it is to live outraged in an age of outrage? Maybe you feel it right now. Someone at work, a family member, those can really trigger. We, it's so easy as believers to live in an age of outrage and to meet it with outrage. But I want to take a look tonight. I want to give us a different way of looking at things. I want to look at the Proverbs. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 18. I want us to look um, at the wisdom of God and what he has for us. And in, in Proverbs 18, there's three things that I think Proverbs calls us to, um, to really kind of center us, to make us think a little more about how we respond in these moments when the emotion welling up inside of us is outrage and anger, is polarization and division, is me versus you, Christians against the world, let's take the hill. How do we respond in those moments? Because I don't want you to leave here thinking, well, it's not okay to be outraged. There are times as believers where we have to have that outrage, but I believe we are in a moment right now in the United States of America, heading into an election season, that how we express that is going to give us a shot to make a real impact. How we express the, the anger or the outrage that comes out in us and how we communicate it is going to give us a chance to truly see the world transformed. So Proverbs chapter 18, we're going to start in verse 17. We're going to bounce around a little bit. Verse 17 reads like this. The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. Wisdom doesn't trust the first report. Way back, do you guys remember the story of the young men on the Capitol steps? He was wearing a Make America Great Again hat, and the American Indians were walking up, and there was this picture snapped of this young 18-year-old yelling at, supposedly yelling at the American Indian on the steps of the White House, build the wall, build the wall, MAGA, MAGA, whatever, whatever, whatever. Do you guys remember that picture? Young man, American Indian gentleman. Do you guys remember how that all unwound? This picture gets popped out on social media. The first report looks like these 18, 19 year old kids were being 18, 19 year old kids were screaming and yelling and the assumption's fair. Like when I was an 18 or 19 year old kid, I did the same thing. Right up in his face, yelling, screaming. All these articles are written so much so that they gave the young man's name and home address to attack him. The first report surely looked like these kids were in the wrong. And then the next day, a video comes out showing the interaction and how it actually went down. And it was very different. There were still some things that could have been done better, don't get me wrong, but it was very different than the first report. And do you know how many journalists had to stop and write articles apologizing for what they wrote in the heat of the moment? But we do the same thing, guys. We see a picture, we hear a report, and our first response is to rail against that instead of waiting until we hear all the angles, until we can see those come and examine it all other directions and hear all of the different reports of what happened, all the sides of the story. I do this with my kids all the time. My kids get fired up, and this kid did this to that kid, and da-da-da, and there's a fight happening, and it's really quick for me to say, whoever told me the story first, well, that sounds pretty plausible. They would do that. I mean, all of our kids are sinners. They mess up. They make mistakes, right? Okay. Yep. Got it. Let me go over here and give him a consequence. But until you start to hear the whole story, you don't quite understand all that happened. Wisdom doesn't trust the first report. I would encourage you as believers that there's one more part to this that I think is really important. Wisdom doesn't trust it at face value. Wisdom only comes from one place, and that's the Word of God. So as you hear things, as you see things unfold in our world, where are you running to find absolute truth? Because it's really easy to run to social media and to run to those places, or even conversation with good, well-intending Christian friends. But wisdom doesn't trust the first report because it holds it against the Scripture. And the Scripture tells us that the first report is not always right. Secondly, in Proverbs 18, if you go down to uh, Proverbs 18, 
verse, thir verse 13 says this. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. In the Christian Standard Version, it says, it is foolishness and his disgrace. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is folly and shame or foolishness and disgrace. I love it. Wisdom doesn't trust your initial assumptions. There's this old saying about the word assume. You guys know what it is. It makes up. I won't say it. My wife's watching on the live stream. But it's true. Might not be the most tactful way of saying it, but it's true. Wisdom doesn't trust your initial assumptions. As humans, we live in this thing called the flesh. And in the flesh, we want to get outraged and we want to assume the worst. We want to assume the end. We want to assume that everything is bad. And as believers, it's a call that we don't trust our initial assumption. Again, we're not just giving an answer. We're not quick to give an answer before we hear. Because that is foolishness and disgrace. Wisdom doesn't trust your initial assumptions. And then the third one is this in 18.2. It says, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinions. My dad used to tell me all the time, I love my dad, unbelievable man of God, pastor of a small church plant down in Maryland, and just been an incredibly faithful man. But he used to tell me all the time, he said, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. You should listen twice as much as you speak. I'm learning. I'm getting a little better at that. I'm not going to say I'm twice as much, but maybe I'm a little better than I used to be, right? But it's really important that we understand that it's not just about us expressing our opinion because wisdom isn't quick to share opinions. Wisdom is quick to show empathy, is quick to learn, is quick to hear, is quick to listen, is quick to sit with someone right where they're at and hear where they are even if they disagree with you, even if they're not on the same political spectrum as you, Aye. even if they don't even know who Jesus is, sit, hear their story. Don't just be quick to share opinions. Listen. I remember a story. Um, my dad was coaching a young man in football named Jeff, and um, Jeff was the starting quarterback and came to practice one day and had a terrible practice. Uh, absolutely awful. And I wasn't there, but I remember my dad telling this story. And I remember my dad coming home and he was talking about how um, bad his practice was. He couldn't believe it. And I just snapped on him and I was screaming and yelling at him and all this stuff. And that outrage came out in him. And later that night he found out um, through, his, through this young man's mom that um, the night before practice, the young man's dad had walked out of the house and left. And you start to realize, like, wow, I was really quick to assume why he was terrible that day. I was really quick to express my frustration and outrage in that young man. But I never actually asked, what's going on, man? What's happening in your life that's causing you to be out of character today? And maybe in that moment, there could have been an opportunity to, to have a conversation to express how much we, my dad loved him, to express uh, the gospel of Jesus in a real and tangible way in that moment. So what's the big idea today? The big idea is that we must engage the outraged world with the gospel. We got to be different. As we approach an election season, we got to be different. Unified, not uniform, unified. United as one under the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we face hardships in our life, as we face whatever may come before us, we engage the outrage in our world, which is only going to get amped up, which is only going to get worse. We engage the outrage with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because we know this, that in this whole thing, what happens is this idea of a mob mentality. Tribalism. And group identity can lead us to this idea of a mob mentality. And that's what we see in our world today. The inclination that some humans have to be a part of a large group, often neglecting their individual feelings in the process. 
and adopting the behaviors and actions of the people around them. Now, a mob mentality, what we see in the world and what we're going to look at in Scripture is two examples that are not very good, but we also see that there are options where we can actually take this mentality and unify behind uh, something that's actually for a positive thing. But this is what we see in our world. We see this mob mentality of the media coming against something, of a political group coming against something, of one team's fans against one thing in someone. There's all these opportunities where we see a mob mentality. We see it in schools with bullying. We see it in all of the workplace. One person's upset, they go and get all their little buddies in their cubicles and they come against one person. This is a mob mentality. This is engaging outrage with outrage. And we see it in scriptures. In Luke chapter 23, we're, we're kind of entering into the, we're going to look at two stories. We're entering into the idea of Jesus hanging on a cross. And you guys remember this. There's two criminals hanging next to Jesus. And there's this mob standing in front of them, railing insults, beating them, stabbing him. All of these things. And Jesus is hanging on the cross and there's two criminals next to him. And the one criminal, he says this. Luke 23, verse 39, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. What that criminal did in the moment was he joined the mob. And quite honestly, did you, did, I mean, do you blame him? Like maybe, just maybe, if I join the mob, they'll realize I'm one of them and they'll take me down. It's really easy. And sometimes in the world's eyes, it looks like the right thing to do to just join the mob to do whatever they're doing. But the criminal rails at Jesus and he joins the mob. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Then verse 40, but the other rebuked that criminal saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? One criminal joins the mob railing at Jesus. The other criminal stands up for what he sees and believes is right. And what does Jesus say to that criminal? Who remembers? This day you will be with me in paradise. There is not always an earthly reward for standing up to the mob, but there is an eternal reward. When we meet outrage... With the gospel of Jesus Christ, there might be hardship here on this earth, but there will be an eternal reward. Not just for you, but maybe for those you have a chance to impact in that space. The second story we're going to look at, and just remember the, the big idea is that we're going to engage the outrage with the gospel. We're going to look in Luke chapter 8. We're going to land the plane here today. In Luke chapter 8, we, we see the story of the woman caught in adultery. And we see um, a response that I think shows us how we engage the outrage. In Luke chapter 8, verse 1, it says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? Let's pause right there for a moment before we look at Jesus' response. The law of Moses clearly said that this was wrong. The law of Moses was given to Moses by who? This was, she was caught in a wrongdoing. And the law of Moses did say it was to stone her. And the scribes and the Pharisees are coming, and they're not approaching it the right way, but they are reading the, the law right. The law was that. That was the law. That's what it said of the time. And so get yourself out of this high horse of like, I can't believe they would do that. They should show grace. At that point in time, they didn't quite see that yet. The person of Jesus hadn't died on the cross for them. They were getting glimpses of it in the moment. They bring her. They throw her in front of Jesus, probably not very well covered, in very humiliating circumstance. And the mob is, I can just imagine it, right? Because I've seen it in our world. The mob is probably hurling insults at her, screaming at her, yelling at her, treating her like absolute trash. 
and they bring her to Jesus. And what does Jesus do? This they said to test him. They might have some charge to bring against him. And this is what Jesus does. The mob is coming. They throw her in the middle. What are we to do? We're to stone her. And Jesus kneels down. And he starts writing in the dirt. There's no inclination here for me that they understood what he wrote. It just, he's probably just scribbling. Like, I don't know what he's trying to do. I don't know if he's creating a diversion. I don't know what, I don't know if he did write something and it just doesn't tell us. I'm not sure, but what it sure looks like is this guy's lost his mind. He's a crazy person. He's writing gibberish in the sand. And there's someone in front of him who's broken the law of Moses that was given to Moses by God. Why would they do this? Can you imagine the outrage rising up in the people? Can you imagine the scribes and Pharisees losing their ever-loving mind in that moment? Because we would too. Because it's easy to engage the outrage with outrage. But Jesus stands up, and as we go on here in the next little section of John chapter 8, he says some stuff. And as they continue to ask him, he stands up, and he says to them, let him who is without sin be among, uh, without sin among you to be the first to throw a stone at her. So he says, hey, hey, look, he's pointing now to the new law that's coming under him, right? That he's going to, he didn't come to abolish that law to make it complete through grace. He's pointing to them and he's saying, hey, that's fine. The law does say that. He's affirming that. And he says, but if you're without sin, you can throw a stone. As believers, we have to remember what we were saved from. As we get enraged with the outside world, as we want to rail against them and join the mob, we have to remember what we were saved from. We were saved from sin. We were given grace upon grace. The story continues, and once more Jesus bends down again and writes on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one. I believe what Jesus did is he engaged the outrage with the gospel. You're in just as much need of a savior as she is. These were the scribes and Pharisees. These weren't just some everyday guy. These were the religious leaders of the time. And Jesus looks at them, says, in your outrage, you need me as much as she needs me. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stands up and he says to her, and this little passage here is really cool in engaging the outrage because Jesus does two things. He, he asks her a question, where are they? Jesus knew the sin in their lives, but he asks them, he says, where are they? Have they not condemned you? I, I don't think Jesus was surprised. I don't think Jesus is ever surprised, but it's a little surprising that the scribes and Pharisees, knowing a little bit about what we know about them now, didn't condemn her. Oh no, I'm perfect. I prayed in the temple. I did all these things. Right? No. The lady says, no one, Lord. And Jesus says this. The outrage in the moment, and here's Jesus' response. Neither do I condemn you. Grace. Grace 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 and yet when people come against us as believers we want to rail against them we want to post on social media we want to get outraged because starbucks took christmas off the cup they're taking christ out of christmas costco doesn't believe the bible's true maybe as believers the response should be what jesus's response was grace then he does something else though Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Go, and from now on, sin no more. He calls her sin out. She couldn't sin no more unless she was sinning currently. He says, you, you were sinning, you were wrong, but because of my grace, go and sin no more. Unbelievable. 
He doesn't just believe, leave it with grace, but he calls out the truth, and he calls it out because of the love he had in his heart for her, because he didn't meet the outrage with outrage. He met the outrage with grace and with love and with compassion and with truth. Because here's the deal, guys. Outrage has no time for dialogue, and it won't be distracted by nuance or even truth. Outrage has no time for dialogue, and it won't be distracted by nuance or even truth. Ed Stetzer, in his book at the end, says this, Jesus calls us to join our lives with him. His same response should be our response. Follow his lead. Repent of our failures. I think Jesus was calling the scribes and the Pharisees, hey, you better take a real long look at your own life. When you get outraged with someone else, you better look deep inside of your heart and see what's causing that, what sin in your life is causing that. And to respond to outrage with radical grace, winsome love, generous compassion, and prayerful hearts that break with the brokenness of this world. We're in a moment, and we have a choice. We can be like we've always been as a church, which has continued to lead to some breakdowns and some issues. Or we can take a real stand, knowing that we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, empowering us, enabling us to live on mission. In a world at worst, living out your calling to be a Christian at your best in the age of outrage. We're going to spend a few moments in reflection, and one of the things that I realize when I read this is we can't respond to outrage with that grace and truth and courage and love unless we've been transformed by the grace and truth and, cur and compassion and love of Jesus. So I, I realize that there's some of you sitting in the room today that have not been transformed by that. Maybe you're coming here today, and we're so glad you're here. That's what CFC is about, making committed followers of Christ. We know you're on a journey, and your journey may have just started today. You might have just showed up in church. But if you haven't been transformed by the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, understanding that he should have been outraged at us, but instead he sent his son to die, son to die on the cross for us, if you can't, if you've never accepted that, if you've never been transformed by that, your default button will always be back to outrage. It will always be. Even if you're sitting here, you've been in here a long time, and you've never been transformed by that, you're going back to the mob, I'm telling you. But what if we were a mob? What if we took that mob mentality and said, we're going to engage the outrage world with the gospel together? If you haven't ever accepted that, if you've never been transformed by that, maybe you're sitting here today and you're like, man, Chris, I'm in a bad spot. We would love to chat with you. I'll be up here. Worship team will be up here during the song, after the song, whatever. We'd love to engage with you. So the questions are there. Have you been transformed by the love and grace of Jesus? Secondly, repent. Look deep in your heart. If you're outraged, if you're joining the mob, what, what is causing that outrage in your heart? And then thirdly, ask God, Lord, allow me the grace to love to see, and love to see people who think or act differently than me, like Jesus did. I laughed at the six, the six o'clock last night, like, I, quite certain, 100% certain, that lady wasn't acting like Jesus in John chapter 8. Jesus didn't respond to her that way. He responded to her with incredible love and grace and truth. May we be a church that does the same thing. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time. In these few moments as we process and as we pray, God, I pray that you would, Lord, just open our hearts. Reveal to us where we might be missing it, where we might be outraged and living like the world, and reveal to us where you're calling us to grace and love and mercy and compassion to those around us, to a world that's outraged. You're calling us to live out the gospel just as you did in sending your son, when, Lord, you should have been outraged with us because of the sin not following you. Lord, we're in desperate need of you in this time. Pour out your Holy Spirit on this place. In Jesus' name.